destroying religion, as Spinozism does, uh, one that shows divine perfection to its best advantage. But all the same, despite uh, the disavowals, there was an unmistakable family resemblance. Spinoza and Bale are the two great opponents then, the two architects of a morally neutral universe, the two who did not build who did not build the moral order on a providential God, divinely ordered universe, and divinely de delivered morality. Consequently, they were the only two major relevant figures in Leibniz's time, uh, well, and, until Diderot, Helvetius, and Dolbach began exerting a powerful impact on the European scene uh, for those who were proposing to, um, to uh, remove the divine providence and to uh, base their uh, assessment of the world on Spinozistic uh, premises. So, uh, of course, there were, there were many other free thinkers, materialists and, and naturalists, denying the reality and truth of natural theology. But uh, before 1770, let's say, at any rate, Spinoza and Bale were always by far the most prominent and discussed rejectionists. These two were influential in the 18th century in a way that Hume never remotely was. So in this respect, again, Leibniz was being amazingly prescient, amazingly relevant, and amazingly practical. For even though most uh, historical surveys of the Enlightenment, um, I think, failed to bring this out, all the major Enlightenment controversies reflect precisely this uh, alignment, leaving aside for the moment, the, uh, the battle between Leibnizio Wolfianism and Newtonianism over which system pre established harmony or physical theology best characterized uh, divine providence and providential ordering of the world, the great Enlightenment controversies, really from um, the Becker disputes of the 1790s about the power and authority of the devil and making the devil the author of sin down to the polemics surrounding Kant and Kantianism in Germany and the European quarrels about basic human rights in the 1790s, ultimately all revolve around this same basic confrontation, divine providence and a world ordered for the best versus Spinoza and Bale. This is true of the battle over whether or not Montesquieu's L'Esprit des Lois should be banned by the papacy in 1748-51 over the tremendous war of the encyclopedia in the late 1750s, the arguments uh, about whether to ban it or not have nothing to do with Locke uh, and the things that historians traditionally have said that the, um, that, or claimed that the encyclopedia was centrally concerned with. It, it's all a question of whether ultimately Diderot's guiding philosophical principles at the heart of the encyclopedia, are they Spinozistic or aren't they Spinozistic? That's the question. And when it's decided that they are, that this is a denial of divinely delivered morality and of divine providence, that's the point in 1759 when the French crown bans it. Okay, the encyclopedia is not allowed. It's banned, and it was seriously banned, and remained banned down to the 1780s. Or uh, the... Uh, f even the fight between Scott's moral sense and French materialism, I think ultimately is the same thing. That, 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 that's the, the virtually, apart from John Miller, virtually the entire Scottish Enlightenment is uh, providential uh, for Ferguson, uh, for uh, Smith, and as I say, in, in, a, in effect, indirectly for Hume as well. Divine providence is fundamental to all of these, and the battle with French materialism is really, again, about this, whether, whether morality is divinely delivered, does divine providence guide the world. The same with uh, Voltaire's war against the système de la nature in the 1770s, or the Fragmentenstreit of the 1770s, uh, and again, that this is really what the pantheismus strike in the 1780s is about. Are we living in a world in which morality is de divinely delivered, ecclesiastical authority is something real, and uh, divine providence guides the course of human life and society, or are we living in a spinozistic world in which um, nature is a blind force and men have to construct their own morality?
Um, Locke, interestingly, was, uh, who, though far more influential probably as a philosopher than Hume in the 18th century, is, uh, and this is really extraordinary when you think how many historical surveys of the Enlightenment have put Locke at the center, supposedly, of the story, is actually never the focal point of major Enlightenment controversies in the 18th century, because his thought was wholly absorbed into conventional, ordinary thinking uh, as early as the 1720s and 30s, actually in Italy and Spain just as much as in France um, or Holland or in Britain, and much too much entwined with God's governance of the world to be anywhere seriously controversial. Uh, Hume, as I say, has no importance at all for the major intellectual controversies before the 1780s, and even then only very marginally, uh, with the exception of Scotland, but that's a separate story. Kantianism burst on the scene as a huge force in philosophy from the mid-1780s onwards in Catholic and Jewish, as well as Protestant Central Europe, but only, as Reinhold keeps emphasizing in his letters on the Kantian philosophy, the work that first made Kant known to a wide public, because of Kantianism's usefulness and predicted unique effectiveness as a barrier to materialism and Spinozism. One only has to open the critique of judgment to see that uh, Spinoza was perceived by Kant himself as his main philosophical opponent and arguably always viewed him in this light from the 1750s onwards. Philosophers usually discuss Kant as if Leibniz, Rousseau, and Hume are the only uh, predecessors one needs to consider when discussing his relations with his predecessors how wrong they are. Recent volume, uh, sorry, Dan Garber, a great friend of mine and warmly loved by me, but the recent volume of conference proceedings, one of whose editors is present with us uh, this evening, um, a very eminent and, and, and brilliant historian of philosophy, but uh, this, is, this, this, this work doesn't even list Spinoza in the index, which seems to me almost a scandal, but something quite sensationally amazing. <laughs> and, um, well, anyway, it's, from a historical point of view, it's something totally uh, um, unjustifiable, I think. But to get back to, to, to Leibniz and his preoccupation with uh, Spinoza and Bale in, in the Theodicy, to cement the link between Christianity and natural theology, Leibniz had to defeat those who argue that there's no such thing as a distinction between contrary to and above reason. And here again, Spinoza and Bale and not other thinkers were the two relevant and unavoidable adversaries that he has to tackle, as he does at, at, at some length. Um, However, it would appear that this dispute concerning whether or not there really is such a distinction in philosophy, however essential for harmonizing the relationship between philosophy and Christian theology, is really quite secondary to the main argument infusing the theodicy. Spinoza and Bale are the two thinkers who had to be principally counted if one wishes to uphold the uh, distinction between um, above and contrary to reason not just because they explicitly deny the validity of any distinction between contrary to and above reason, but because they are the two thinkers denying also divine governance of the world and divine delivery of our moral code. This means that they were the true founders, in a way that Hume never was, of the modern idea that the universe is morally neutral and that morality should therefore be based not on some supposed divinely given code, but instead on the principle of social utility, the main justification Bale in fact gives for his sweeping toleration, and uh, the basis of the moral philosophy uh, of Spinoza and later Diderot and Dolbach and Helvetius and the others who collectively contributed something which uh, in the years around, before, both before and after 1789, something very puzzling to historians. Perhaps it makes more sense to philosophers. I'm not sure. Perhaps it doesn't. It would also be rather baffling to philosophers. But it, when you read the revolutionary journals in 1789, uh, for example, you are told all the time that these great changes, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, uh, the transformation of human society and the betterment of the whole world is all the work of uh, la philosophie moderne or la nouvelle philosophie sometimes. Uh, Catholic apologists often call it philosophism. 
And uh, the disciples in there, the many disciples in there, Zedido and Dolbach, often, just for short, call it la, la philosophie. So it's not surprising that both historians and philosophers uh, are likely to be very baffled by this, especially as this phenomenon, uh, I I extremely important though it is, is, as far as I can see, not discussed anywhere in the literature, or either on the Enlightenment or the French Revolution, what on earth are they talking about? By the, and the, also in German, the moderne philosophy, used in this sense, you only have to look in uh, Lichtenberg, for example, uses it a lot in this sense, obviously means Spinozism. Uh, and uh, also in English, you see, um, not only in, in serious works of philosophical discussion, but in, uh, there's a whole book on anti-Jacobin novels in English for the 1790s and the beginning of the 19th century. Um, for 30 or 40 years in English, the expression modern, th we've forgotten this totally, or pro probably almost nobody in the room will be aware of this. It's extraordinary how all this has uh, kind of slipped from view. Uh, but the, the, the term modern philosophy which is a very specific cultural, almost a technical term at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th, is extremely pejorative. If somebody, uh, if you find a character in a novel of around 1800 or 1810 uh, or 1820 in England who's been influenced by modern philosophy, this means he's completely mad and is extremely dangerous. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, we, we've just lost any sense of this This notion of modern philosophy, what it, what it means and where it comes from and what it consists of. But it is a structure built by these French materialist thinkers and the many, many, the, the, the philosophe um, um, uh, revolutionnaire, the 20 or 30 people who dominated the National Assembly in 1789, people Mirabeau and Condorcet and Siez and Volney, very important, Brissot, all these people who'd written lots of works of philosophy before 1789, dominated by this way of thinking. But I think it ultimately reaches back to the premises laid down by uh, Spinoza and Bale, which is where Diderot and Dolbach get it all from, of, sometimes indirectly via Tolland and, uh, um, and some, other, some of the and Collins and, and some other determinists of the early 18th century. This means they were the true founders in a way that Hume never was of the modern idea that the universe then is morally neutral and that morality should therefore be based not on some supposed divinely given code but instead on the principle of social utility. What matters more than perhaps anything else about the structure of the theodicy is uh, a critique of uh, a set of ideas revolving around Spinoza and Bale, that amounts to a denial of the reasonableness of inferring God's goodness from what passes in the world. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I think, uh, well, let, let me, well, one knows that he takes care, that, that God takes care of the whole universe whereof all the parts are connected, and one must therefore infer that he has had innumerable considerations whose results made him deem it inadvisable to prevent certain evils. Well, there's the greatest attempt to provide a theodicy that we have for the Enlightenment. This means that, that universal right is the same for God and for men. But the question of fact is quite different in their case uh, and in his. In his case, argues Leibniz, the in individual events have to be viewed in the context of the whole. Evil exists, and it exists in, in three categories, as we heard several times yesterday and today, the metaphysical evil, physical evil, and moral evil. But the brunt of the argument really turns on the question of physical evil or suffering, since theology provides a comprehensive explanation of how uh, moral evil uh, is uh, perpetrated by men, how, how the corruption of men makes that possible. Since God does not subsequently change things, which would be equivalent to changing his mind, everything was settled beforehand in the pre-established harmony, a concept that depends on Leibniz's guiding distinction between things that are intrinsically impossible, such as to make two and two make six, or what is... Um, not the case, but could